and I, I'm not sure how to turn off the camera, so leave it like that, I guess. One sec. Put this to my other vacuum. All right, so now you, uh, you see my screen. If you don't see my screen, please let me know. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the title of my talk is, it's kind of self-explanatory, uh, keeping track about an explosion of data. And there is an explosion of data in bone and soft tissue pathology the last decade or so. And the reason for that is because of next generation sequencing. So let's start first with a very hot topic in the in the oncological world, and it is a hot topic because it makes a lot of difference to patients uh, because these patients um, can um, they have targeted treatment, a targeted therapy now with um, NTRAC inhibitors, and uh, a lot of tumors, including bone and soft tissue tumors, and not only bone and soft tissues, but carcinomas and other tumors, they show NTRAC fusion. So. It's a hot topic, and I'm, I'm going to start with a case that actually I had a few years ago. Um, this patient here, and uh, let me see if my pointer, there is a pointer here. Uh, I'll use my arrow or annotate. Let me see. Annotate pointer. Pointer. Razor. All right. Uh, <clears throat> this is a case I had went uh, about in 2016 and this patient had this tumor in uh, approximately 2012 and uh, you can see here sorry i don't have the idea the webex sorry but yeah all right um So this patient had a bump in here, in here, in here, in here back, and uh, this we see a tumor here. This is the epidermis, and this is the the tumor that it was actually infiltrating into the subcutaneous fasc uh, subcutaneous tissue, with uh, um, uh, infiltrating growth pattern uh, within the subcutis. As you see here, it kind of infiltrates the subcutaneous tissue in a honeycomb fashion, and it was diffusely positive for CD34. And other areas that look a little bit different. They had a more fascicular growth pattern with a lot of mitotic activity. So this was called in 2012 as fibrosarcomatous transformation of um, uh, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, DFSP, which is a reasonable diagnosis at that time with the knowledge that we had, and that was in 2012. The patient, um, it was going to the margin, but the patient did not return for re-excision. After a year, the tumor had a local recurrence. And this is the scar from the previous operation, and this is the bump of the local recurrence that they excise, and it really looks like a sarcoma, right? It has this fascicular growth pattern in going into the fat. It looks like fibrosarcoma, and it was CD34 negative, and it was called local recurrence of fibrosarcomatous dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. That was in 2013. And then in 2016, I got a metastasis to the groin. So the original tumor was back in the back and I got a metastasis in the groin. And it looked a little bit different. He had these stellate cells in a mixoid background, um, <clears throat> obviously malignant with a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm, vesicular chromatin pattern. And uh, I wanted to confirm that indeed this was a fibrosarcomatous DFSP. And as you know, DFSP, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, they have a uh, characteristic fusion that in includes, involves in about 95% of the cases, involves the PDGFB gene uh, called 1A1A6. And uh, I couldn't prove it. I did this. I couldn't prove that fusion. So I ended up doing next generation sequencing, RNA sequencing to, to try to prove it. And surprisingly, the tumor actually did not have a fusion and molecular event that it was characteristic for dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, but on the contrary, had a fusion between EML4 and NTRAC gene. And actually, that was the first case of a malignant NTRAC neoplasm in the skin, that, and we published that. 
And uh, it is potentially very important because Amtrak fusions are relatively now the new uh, kid on the block. A lot of different tumors are positive for Amtrak fusion and the Amtrak genes are the Amtrak 1 gene, the Amtrak 2 gene, and the Amtrak 3 gene. And uh, they um, translate into the uh, proteins, the TRK, TRKB, and TRKC protein. And Androc fusions can be seen in a, a lot of different tumors. You can see that in carcinomas like colorectal carcinoma, cholangial carcinoma, thyroid tumors. You can see that in GIST. You can see that in melanoma. Characteristically, you can see that in infant, infantile fibrosarcoma in uh, neural tumors, um, in a lot of different entities, including various sarcomas. And uh, uh, colleagues from uh, my institution, Memorial Sloan Kettering, they've done a huge study where they uh, went back to the molecular data, because Memorial has tons of molecular data. I actually show about 34,000 cases and uh, see how many cases and what are the percentage of these cases that actually have Anthrac fusions, and it can be something extremely low, like in melanomas, like 0.36% to tumors that we know that have Anthrac fusions, like the inflammatory microblastic tumor, thyroid carcinomas, other carcinomas, and sarcomas. It's a very low percentage, but still it is seen in a, sub in a subset of tumors. Now, <clears throat> the mesenchymal tumors <clears throat> that they have Anthrac fusions or kinase fusions in general, because Antrac is one of the kinases, but you have other kinases as well, like RET, uh, BRAF, etc. It's a, an emerging category of tumors that is being developed the last uh, five, ten years, and uh, it's very important to recognize this for reasons that I would explain very soon, but. They're not always malignant, so they have a broad spectrum, a broad histologic spectrum. They can look from benign to intermediate malignancy to fully malignant, and they can uh, be superficial. They can be deep. They can infiltrate the fat, as you see here. They can have this characteristically, but always. But if you see that, you uh, need to remember that you may be dealing with an antrac fused mesenchymal neoplasm. This perivascular colonization, or they can have a fibrosarcoma-like appearance, the more malignant ones looking like MPNST. And many of these tumors characteristically, but not all of them, but many of these tumors have S100 and CD34 positivity. So if you see that combination in a mesenchymal spindle cell lesion, think uh, about an Entrac lesion. And if it's benign and you miss it, uh, well, it's not the end of the world, but if it's of intermediate malignancy or more importantly, a high grade malignant neoplasm, then that is a big miss. And it's a big miss because, as I told you, there are targeted treatment. So it makes a lot of difference. So people have tried to come up with uh, different screening strategies because the percent, the overall percentages of tumors with enteroc fusions is actually pretty low. You cannot do molecular on these cases. I mean, you, it's impossible. It takes forever, uh, tons of money, and it's just not cost effective. So there have been, been developed different algorithms to see which cases to actually need to uh, test further uh, so I can inform, I can do the right diagnosis and inform my oncologist colleagues uh, about an enteroc fusion. So if you have a metastatic or an unresectable disease, which uh, if you do just surgery just like that, it's expected to be to cause severe morbidity. And if it is less, for example, less than two years old and you think it's infantile fibrosarcoma or congenital mesoblastic nephroma histology, both of them have enteric fusion. So it's reasonable to go first to fish. Fluorescent in cyto hybridization is cheaper, is faster, but of course <clears throat> it's not next generation sequencing if you don't it only detect one partner and if you the fish is positive then you can say okay it's an infantile fibrosarcoma or congenital mesoblastic lymphoma and then you can consider targeted inhibitor therapy now if the fish is negative and you still very high suspicious that you're dealing with these two entities you can actually do an immunohistochemistry the pan trk which is 
not great, but it's good enough. <clears throat> and if it's positive as a screening, then you can actually move to do NTRAC one, two, three fusion fees or do a sequencing. If um, as a morphology that has NTRAC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm spectrum, the morphologies that I showed you in the previous slide, does it look like infantile fibrosarcoma? Does it have a lipofibromatosis like or perivascular and stroma hyalinization? If it has a morphology that it could increase the pretest probability of the test uh, that you may be dealing with an intranet fusion, you can screen with immuno. And if it's positive, you move to uh, next generation sequencing panels. Uh, or if it's negative, you and you still think it could be, you still, uh, because it's not 100% the sensitivity, you still may be considering to uh, a ne next ratio of sequencing. And you can do DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing, a lot of different platforms. Uh, they start becoming available in Greece. The availability is not like you see in the abroad, which is very, very common, but in Greece is still limited and very expensive, but, uh, they are important and public hospitals start doing that now slowly, slowly. And of course they are available in the, in the private sector, not the panel that you could see as a common thing abroad, but okay. Uh, if you're dealing with a very specific question and it's very important because now we have targeted treatment that actually can make a lot of difference, uh, to patient and it can be histology agnostic. And I repeat. Histology agnostic means that uh, patients, it doesn't matter if it's a carcinoma or if it's a sarcoma, et cetera. Uh, these people respond for an X amount of time to targeted treatment, treatment regardless, regardless of the primary diagnosis. And uh, if you have an NTRAC fusion, and a, a TRK, A, B, B, or C, NTRAC 1, 2, or 3, there are targeted treatment now, such as atrectinib or larotrectinib. FDA approved and European approved, European Medical Association approved. Other kinases, you can have a red fusion, that's a kinase, that um, there are targeted treatments such, such as regorafenib or selpercartinib. Arc fusions, crizodinib, lortazinib, med fusions, EGFR, they're all these fusions in the kinases, right? They're membrane bound receptor tyrosine kinases that actually you have a lot of different drugs that you can use if you detect this fusion. And of course, you cannot detect until you do molecular. Uh, other uh, tumors, uh, if I have ABL1, you can see that in uh, leukemias, you can have targeted treatment. And if you have BRAF, as you see in melanoma on RAF, you can have other BRAF inhibitors or MEK inhibitors, such as uh, uh, Vemurafenib or Drabrafenib. Uh, or trametinib, a mechanism inhibitor. So a lot of different targeted treatment, I mean, has exploded the last 10 years with good results. Uh, but of course, you need to have the molecular signature of this tumor, right? Uh, otherwise, you, you, you can't do it. And uh, NTRAC, the NTRAC fusions, that I told you, is very important. So that's why it was very important in our patient, because my patient was carrying the diagnosis of fibrosarcomatous dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, which has not an, not an NTRAC fusion, but it has a PDGFB fusion and it responds to imatinib. So in fibrosarcomatous DFSP with metastasis, the oncologist will use imatinib. So my patient had the, had the wrong diagnosis, but with a patient with a metastasis with an NTRAC fusion, like my patient eventually had, you actually imatinib would not work but you have options such as larotrectinib or atrectinib. So you make the huge difference how you, what kind of targeted treatment is going to, is going to work at this patient, who, which this patient especially had actually metastasis. And the first drug that got approved for NTRAC fusion was a larotrectinib. It was a, a seen in a, two big studies in Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine, and it was used in children and adults with really great results histology agnostic. It didn't really matter what the pathologist called it. And now there are different drugs that are available uh, in the market. So larotrectinib was the first drug that was used and is FDA approved. Um, we have now uh, another um, uh, antrectinib, which is FDA approved. 
Um, the selitractinib is another drug that is FDA has FDA um, orphan drug designation, and then there are other drugs that have been under investigation, such as repotractinib or other investigative drug that are not yet approved. So the list gets expanding, expanding, and so you now you kind of get a sense why this was very important uh, for 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 these patients because it was not just a, an esoteric pathology. Um, diagnosis, but actually it was very important for medication wise uh, because my patient, our patient had uh, metastasis. Now, moving on on a new mesenchymal tumor that it was recognized for the first time uh, in WHO 2020 edition, uh, superficial CD34 positive fibroblastic tumor. Uh, it's a new entity. It got into the WHO book two years ago, but it's very important because actually it can be um, uh, misdiagnosed as something very aggressive, but actually this tumor is not very aggressive. So the first paper came actually quite a few years ago. I was one of the co-authors. I was um, a trainee of Sarah Weiss, which was a legend in bone and soft tissue pathology at that time in Emory University, and I remember she came to me when I first got there and she gave me a pack of cases and say, have a look at this because I'm convinced that this is a different entity. It's a distinct entity, has very characteristic morphology, stains very characteristically. So we need to write a paper about it. That was back in 2013. It took seven years for our community to accept it as a distinct entity uh, and got in the WHO uh, two years ago. And other people followed suit. Um, it's another uh, tumor from China, uh, another series of the superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumor. A few years, uh, a few years after our first publication. So all these tumors, the superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumors, are superficial tumors. Uh, they're, they're not deep. They are suprafascial. So you uh, may see this uh, uh, in your office. Say a patient comes with a bump, or if you practice dermatology, you may actually encounter these tumors. And they were all suprafascial, and uh, they had uh, we have a good follow up in our series. And uh, one patient, everybody was uh, no evidence of disease except one patient that actually had a metastasis to a lymph node uh, after seven years, right? So it just show you at that time he wasn't <clears throat> behaving in a highly aggressive fashion, but he had a um, potential for metastasis. So he was behaving in a low grade fashion. So it was really a tumor of what we call in soft tissue pathology, a tumor of intermediate malignancy. And there are a lot of different mesenchymal tumors uh, in the WHO classification of intermediate malignancy and the definition of a mesenchymal neoplasm of intermediate malignancy is a neoplasm that has a high rate of local recurrence. Let's say it recurs in 20 to 30, 40 percent of the cases if you don't excise it with clear margins, but it has a very low rate of metastasis, less than 5 percent. It's not zero. It's intermediate malignancy, but it's less than 5 percent. So quite low risk for giving a metastasis. And that's how it looks like. This is the epidermis here, and this is the dermis, and then the tumor that it was involving the lower dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. And it had this kind of storyform uh, appearance or short fascicles with these cells infiltrating into the subcutaneous tissue. And if you're going on high power, the cells are looking very atypical. They were looking very large with very irregular nuclear contours and this prominent nucleus. It has this glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm with a little bit of lymphohistiocytic infiltrate in the background. Some other areas that had a lot of histiocytes. But the fact that it was looking so ugly, and actually a lot of these cases had misdiagnosed by other pathologists as some kind of high-grade malignancy, but it didn't have a lot of mitotic figures. So if you have something that looks very ugly, but it doesn't have a lot of mitotic figures, you have to pause and think, is that possible that actually I'm dealing with something different rather than a high-grade sarcoma, right? So it really uh, makes you question about the right diagnosis. And again, these cells have this very pleomorphic um, large nucleoli with um, 
pseudo nuclear inclusions. But if you did a KS67, KS7 is an immunostochemical stain, stain. We try to, uh, per, uh, it's a proliferation index, how proliferative is our tumor? And it was actually very low, right? So it's just very unusual for a high grade sarcoma. And very characteristically, these tumors were diffusely positive for CD34, wall to wall CD34, which is unusual for uh, any other neoplasm apart from dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, which is diffusely positive for CD34. And this tumor didn't look anything like BFSP. And then this tumor's characteristic also have this multifocal positivity for keratins. The eye, because of keratins, they want to see, well, could this be an epithelial sarcoma, which characteristically in more than 95% of the cases, they have loss of nuclear expression. But this nuclear expression here was retained. And P53 was uh, completely negative, so it didn't have a P53 mutation that you see that more commonly in a high-grade undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or a mix of fibro sarcoma. All these entities that were potentially in the differential. And then after a few years, after our first publication, people realized that some tumors, they had translocations involving the PRDM10 gene. And some of these tumors are actually were similar morphologically with the superficial CD34 fibroblastic sarcoma. As a matter of fact, some of these tumors that PRDM10 fusions had been discovered, they actually had the original diagnosis as superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumor, where other tumors has a di original diagnosis of pleomorphic hyalinizing angiectatic tumor or a low-grade undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma all these tumors that it could, they were actually in the differential with uh, superficial CD34 fibroblastic sarcoma in the original paper. So there really it smells like there's something, some commonality here with the PR, with the tumors that they show PRDM10 gene fusions and the tumors that we called superficial CD34 fibroblastic sarcoma. And this is some examples. Most of them were all superficial <clears throat> and suprafascial. You see they're subcutaneous, but they're not underneath this fascia. Some of the cases were going beyond the fascia and were involving the skeletal muscle, but many of them, the majority or the bulk of the tumor was on the superficial aspect of the tumor. And as you see here, even if you're not a pathologist, you can actually appreciate commonalities. You have this very look very pink, very kind of voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm. All these and the cells will have large nucleoli, nucleomegaly, with irregular nuclear contours, vesicular nuclear pattern, moderately prominent nucleoli, and pseudonuclear inclusions. Some of them have quite mitotic figures, but most of them didn't have any increased mitotic figures at all. But the tumors, other than that, are looking very ugly, and they actually behaved very well. They didn't have an adverse outcome with good follow up. And these tumors actually had PRDM10 fusions with different partners. It was either the cited 2 or the MED12 partners and the PRDM10 uh, partner, which was the common theme along these uh, tumors. And you can see here that the same thing as a super, superficial fibroblastic tumor they were all positive for CD34. So really the beginning of a discovery to actually see some kind of association between these tumors. Uh, so people um, studied that further and actually realized what was uh, suspected from the beginning of the previous paper that actually superficial CD34 positive fibroblastic tumor and PRDM10 rearranged soft tissues, they have a lot of things in common, and they actually may actually belong to the same spectrum, or even they may actually represent the same entity. They have overlapping morphological, as I show you, immunostochemical, as I show you, and actually genetic features. And this is uh, another case of superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumor, again, this was a little bit deeper going into the subcutaneous tissue, a little bit of fascicular growth pattern, but here this tumor very superficial with cells that they have here volum voluminous clear cytoplasm kind of resembling lipoblasts, 
with nucleomegaly and irregular nuclear contours looking pretty ugly, but with very low mitotic activity. And this tumor, which has, has a characteristic eosinophilic, voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm as well, has very characteristically diffuse strong CD34 positivity. Not many tumors do that. CD34 is a very non-specific stain. It stains a gazillion different tumors, but the stain consistently and uh, recurrently a tumor wall to wall diffusely and strongly is not that common. And very common, these tumors have uh, multifocal positivity for keratin, which is very common in sarcomas or in mesenchymal tumors. It doesn't mean necessarily it's carcinoma or sarcomatoid carcinoma. And people have done molecular studies, and this plot that I show you here is a plot from SNP array. And the numbers here, what they depict is the different chromosomes. One chromosome, the chromosome two, three, four, and X, Y, this was a man. And uh, this is the middle line. And when you have, uh, when you see this uh, diagram in the middle, that means that the tumor genomically is very quiet. It doesn't have a lot of aberrations. It doesn't have a lot of gains of genetic material or losses. Of genetic material, if you have gains, you will see um, it will go up here. The line when you have losses of genetic material, you go down. So in pleomorphic sarcomas, in pleomorphic high-grade sarcomas, like in malignant tumors, uh, they are very unstable genetically. That's why they look so ugly and pleomorphic. They are very unstable, so you get a lot of gains and a lot of losses all over the place. So you have a very unstable genome that you actually see that with the molecular technique that's called SNP array, single nucleotide um, polymorphism array, right? So the fact that this is flat, you don't have gains or aberrations, to me, it looks like a needle and tumor. And that goes as well with the uh, low mitotic activity, and it goes as well, as well with the Follow-up we have from all these studies that these actually these tumors do not behave very aggressively, but they behave in a low-grade fashion uh, because they uh, usually nothing happens to the patients, or after many years they can get a metastasis. So a low-grade fashion to have meaningful studies for low-grade mesenchymal neoplasm, you need to have a lot of years of follow-up. Five years is not enough because. Patients with low grade neoplasm may actually can throw a metastasis after five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. They need a long, uh, a lifetime follow up, right? So if you have a paper with only one or two years, and it's, it's a pretty a useless paper. And the other thing that they notice after gene expression studies is that they notice that one of the genes and subsequently its protein is actually overexpressed. Uh, and the protein that is overexpressed on the gene expression is called CAMDM3. Uh, CAMDM3. And uh, here it's uh, what we call unsupervised hierarchical clustering of 1737 genes. Uh, and you can see here that the uh, superficial fibroblastic tumor or the are actually um, clusters together forms a separate cluster, uh, the PRDM, uh, G, uh, the PRDM uh, fused superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumor, which means it's, uh, it's probably a distinct entity and there is no overlap with other entities such as benign fibrous histocytoma, DFSP, mixofibrosarcoma, uh, mixoinflammatory mixo fibroblastic sarcoma, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, all these different entities is actually lands on its own. It's gene expression pattern on unsupervised hierarchical clustering, which further supports that we're probably dealing with a distinct entity, hence uh, a new, uh, hence its recognition as a distinct entity by the latest issue of the WHO. So what they realized here is that they had a high expression of this gene and we have an immunohistochemistry uh, CAM D3, and it worked really well. Um, people have studied that. So almost 100% concordance with CD34, which again, it's helpful, but CD34 is not a specific. So another 
new, very, very new immunohistochemical stain to be used in conjunction with CD34 is uh, the immunohistochemical stain for CAM D3 and appears to work very well. And it doesn't stain in the same manner, this diffusion strong positivity with other entities which are in the differential. And this is a paper that got published a couple of months ago and is the uh, largest series of the superficial CD34 fibroblastic tumor from Boston. <laughs> they had about 59 cases. Uh, you can see a gross picture here. So superficial, this is the skin, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, and a well-circumscribed tumor here. And uh, these tumors have a lot of histiocytes that they can look a little bit orangey grossly. That's why you see that orange who here, superficial. Many times, characteristically, they have these lymphoid aggregates at the periphery. Um, these tumors were entrapping at nexal structures, and they had one tumor that actually metastasized <clears throat> to the lymph node after uh, uh, a few years. I can't remember the exact number of years. And again, these tumors actually, they looked at the CAM D3, they were diffusely positive. And the other thing they noticed is that these tumors were actually positive in a significant number of cases for nuclear WT1, which is not a very specific stain, but it's not that common to have mesenchymal neoplasm with nuclear WT1 positivity. Uh, so that could be a poten potential helpful adjunct in making uh, the correct diagnosis. Now, moving on, uh, the, what is new in the commonest sarcoma of the skin? So, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, or DFSP. As I told you, uh, this was uh, the diagnosis that was rendered in the first case, what I showed you, which was not correct. But the, the, the most common sarcoma on the skin is dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And this is a classic example of uh, DFSP. Where you see here it's superficial. This is the epidermis. This is the dermis. And the tumor extends from the mid dermis all the way down to the subcutaneous tissue, involving the subcutaneous tissue in a honeycomb fashion. And they had these uh, short fascicles it grow in a storyform growth pattern. Uh, and uh, the tumor is one of the tumors that also is diffusely positive for CD34. And again, CD34 is not a specific uh, stain, but to have a diffuse and strong wall-to-wall -wall positivity, there are not that many tumors. And approximately 95%, as I told you when I presenting the first case, they have a rearrangement <clears throat> uh, between chromosomes 17 and 22 involving the genes called one a1 and PDGFP, and that's very important because uh, that actually creates an autocrine loop, which is responsive to uh, imatinib. And um, the the uh, but uh, DFSP can actually have a lot of different patterns, not just the classic pattern that I I, I show you. It has different patterns, uh, very characteristically some. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans with fibrosarcomatous transformation. They have what we call the myoid nodules. Uh, some of the tumors may have had this myxematous, myxedematous stroma with ectatic thin wall vessels. Some of the tumors had um, multi um, fluoret like multinucleated giant cells, which are reminiscent of giant cell fibroblastoma, which is the equivalent of DFSP. Uh, in children, uh, some of these um, uh, cases had uh, infiltration into the skeletal muscle, or they had this mix of fibrosarcoma-like morphology. So a lot of different morphologies, but if you search hard enough or you put more sections from the tumor, you'll find more classic areas of DFSP that will point you to the right direction. Now the new thing is that is that. About five percent of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, they did not have they did not have the call one A one PDGF six uh, PDGF two PDGF six uh, uh, PDGF B uh, uh, fusion, 
Um, and the reason for that is two. One of them have cryptic translocations that we cannot detect them with the current molecular techniques, like fluorescent inside of hybridization, because they're cryptic. Uh, but the other thing is some of them actually have an alternative, alternative gene uh, other than PDGFB, which is the PDGFD, which belongs to the same family and uh, mechanistically from functionality point of view, it actually works the same, uh, creates this autocrine loop. Uh, but if you want to prove it or it's a very difficult case uh, or you have uh, limited material and you cannot find PDGFB fusions, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. It could be a uh, DFSP with PDGFD fusions. And uh, these tumors, in a transcriptomic classification, as you see here, uh, an unsupervised hierarchical clustering, like the one I showed you in previous slides, they actually were clustering together with the PDGFB. So it doesn't. So it means it's not a distinct entity. It's actually part of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance, which has an al alternating al alternative uh, partner PD gene rather than PDGFB. What you hear, you see here in infantile fibrosarcoma, who characteristically have ETV6 and TRAC3 fusions, or EWSR1, CREB3, L3, low grade fibromixture sarcoma, or inflammatory fibroblastic tumor, or clear sarcoma. They are different separate clusters because they are distinct entities. But the BDGFD. It's not a distinct entity, it's just a DFSP with a different gene. And uh, so far, we don't have tons of cases, but so far it appears that it's novel PDGFD uh, with a couple of novel partners called 6A3 and a couple of others. They, for some reason, they appear to have a predilection to breast. We don't know yet, and we don't know if it's gonna stand the test of time when you have sequencing hundreds of cases but if you have a case, a difficult case that uh, you need to do molecular to prove that you're dealing with a DFSP and it's in the breast and uh, you turn or the chest and you cannot prove it because you can't find your PDGFB fusion is negative uh, with fish, uh, think about a PDGFD fused dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. And uh, people looked a little bit more in depth and there are most of the dermatofibrosarcomas, they involve the dermis, and then they are very infiltrative into the subcutaneous tissue. But there are very rarely some dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance that they only involve the subcutis. They don't involve the dermis at all. And when involved the subcutis, paradoxically, they actually are pretty well circumscribed, which is unusual because classically, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance is actually um, uh, uh, infiltrates into the subcutaneous tissue in a very uh, infiltrating fashion. So some of them are uh, circumscribed, especially the ones that are there in the subcutis. And actually, they found that the ones that are circumscribed, they actually had more commonly PDGFD uh, with EMILIN2 gene doesn't really matter, but it seems to me maybe a, a correlation, a molecular morphological correlation uh, with the DFSPs that there are purely subcutaneous. Now, if you don't have the funding, you don't have the means to do a molecular, uh, because in, like many places in Greece or most of the places, um, there are some other tools that you can do if you want to prove it. And a very new tool is to do a PDGFB RNA inside to hybridization which appears to work pretty well uh, and actually is especially helpful when actually has fibrosarcoma to transformation. And that's why you need it. You know, you don't need to do molecular or to do fancy stuff if you have a classic dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. You don't, you don't need anything. But if you have just a fibrosarcoma to transformation, like the case that I show you in the first place, my first case, which was misdiagnosed, then it's important uh, because it will make a difference how you approach this patient. And actually, the RNA inside the hybridization, it actually works better. Uh, it works better uh, in 
patients would have fibrosarcomatous transformation because what happens is the fusion is the initial event, okay? You have the initial event uh, uh, before the tumor gets transformed to fibrosarcoma. It transforms because you have additional genetic events and uh, it's complicated and we don't fully understand it. But one of the things that also is happening is you got amplification of the fusion, of the fusion. So you have a lot of copies of the fusion, and that's why the RNA cytohybridization actually is actually brighter with fibrosarcomatous transformation, where actually it's the, the scenario that you need the most your uh, this tool. So yeah, it can be uh, extremely helpful. So let's move now to different vascular neoplasm, which is a very difficult topic. And uh, there are a lot of different vascular tumors. And let's start from vascular tumors of intermediate malignancy. So here you see the term intermediate malignancy, what I told you, and most of the mesenchymal tumors in the WHO that in distinct entities are intermediate malignancy. And again, intermediate malignancy, they have a higher rate of local recurrence. So you need to excise them with clear margins, a high rate of local recurrence, but they have a... Uh, 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 a low rate of metastatic disease, less than 5%. And one of them is called retiform hemangioendothelioma. What is retiform hemangioendothelioma? It is a locally aggressive, rarely metastasizing, so by definition, intermediate malignancy, which is most commonly, you see that superficially, uh, and mainly occurs in adults. It can occur in a, a wide age spectrum, but predominantly it occur in adults, and prefer preferentially it involves the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the distal extremities. Characteristically, and I show you pictures, has these elongated shaped vessels that they resemble red testis. Red testis, in the, it's a, uh, you see that in, a, in the testis. And similar to, um, what we call the PILA, which we're going to talk a little bit about this entity. Um, it's lined by hobnail endothelial cells, and it has this intravascular uh, papillary projection, uh, which there are not many, but usually you see that in the, in the uh, uh, intravascular lymphangio and endothelioma. So it's closely related to uh, an entity called PILA, and it's under the umbrella of hopnate hemangioendotheliomas. And this is how a classic uh, retiform hemangioendothelioma looks like. This is your skin epidermis, and this is your dermis. And uh, it doesn't look normal dermis. It has these um, vascular channels here, all these channels, this white space, they're all vessels. And the vessels, you know, this kind of resemble uh, red testis. Um, that's because that's how red testis looks normally, uh, the normal histology. Uh, the wall here you see have these endothelial cells line the vascular spaces, and they have this hobnail appearance, uh, as we call it. You know, it look like uh, small tombs, right? This hobnail uh, appearance, classic case of red form hemangioendothelioma. And again, lined by lymphocytes with the morphology uh, um, like red testis, and it has this hobnail cells at the vascular channels. So the new thing that they found recently is that these tumors, some of these tumors have recurrent gene rearrangements that actually involve the genes YAP1 and MAMEL2. And that's very important because uh, in the difficult cases, you can actually do molecular and prove that you're dealing with a red form hemangioendothelioma. And uh, red form hemangioendothelioma has these fusions that actually shares with another entity. We're going to talk a little bit later, the composite hemangioendothelioma, which is another entity of um, intermediate malignancy. Uh, it, it, it shares the same fusions, red form, but for now, just focus on red form hemangioendothelioma. On the contrary, Composite hemangioendothelioma. It's another entity under the WHO. It's a locally aggressive, rarely metastasizing, again, intermediate malignancy, 
neoplasm, which it doesn't have, it has different patterns. It, it doesn't look just like red from hemangioma glioma, but it has different patterns. In one area, it looks like hemangioma. In other area, it looks like epithelial hemangioendothelioma. In other area, it looks like retiform hemangioendothelioma. So a lot of different patterns. That's why, hence, the term composite. It's chiefly seen in adults. It's very rare to see it in pediatric cases or in congenital cases. And again, this tumor as well involves superficial soft tissue. And again, the definition of intermediate malignancy has a high rate of local recurrence, almost half of the cases, you have to take the whole thing out, but sometimes you cannot, and sometimes you have to live with positive margins. You don't have to be very aggressive. I mean, I had a case uh, when I was in Dartmouth of a patient with composite hemangioendothelioma, who uh, it was involving the whole upper arm. So the only, re the only way to get rid of this is actually to do an arm amputation, which was a terrible idea. Um, so you were watching that very closely because sometimes composite hemangioglioma can transform to angiosarcomas, but you can watch it that very carefully. But if you have a pathologist who doesn't know what they're doing uh, because they don't see these cases frequently enough, easily may call a, a small sample as an angiosarcoma. And if you have an angiosarcoma that involves the whole arm, you need to disarticulate this arm. You need to do a whole... Uh, take the whole arm out. So you can imagine how high the chief, the, the stakes are and how important it is to have a pathologist who actually know what they're doing for these very rare and very difficult cases. And that's why this patient should be referred to uh, centers of excellence where um, surgeons are trained in mesenchymal neoplasms and pathologists that are trained in mesenchymal neoplasms and radiologists and, uh, and radiotherapists that are trained in mesenchymal neoplasms. Otherwise, you don't provide uh, standard of care. Of course, I can understand it can be difficult in some circumstances, but you have to be aware of this, of this, uh, of these limitations. Now, as I told you, composite hemangioendothelioma has uh, different patterns. So it can look retiform hemangioglioma in some area. It can look like epithelial hemangioglioma. It's another entity we're going to talk in a little bit. Spindle cell hemangioma in another area, which is another entity we're going to talk in a little bit, or a low-grade angiosarcoma-like. So when you see a lot of different patterns and you don't know where to put it, it's probably a composite hemangioglioma. So this is a few um, examples. So in some areas, it looks like spindle cell hemangioma. This uh, 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 cytoplasmic vacuoles and some others looks like a spindle cell hemangioma and some others looks like cavernous hemangioma and some other areas looks like retiform hemangioma right with these home nail cells and some other areas looks like epithelioid hemangioma like these cells in the mixoid background and single cells or in some other areas looks like angiosarcoma or cavernous hemangioma, uh, et cetera. Now, again, as I told you, the same thing with red form hemangioma. Composite hemangioma can actually share the same fusion. So if you find this fusion, it's not going to tell you one way or the other. But when once you are, once you suspect that you're dealing with a composite and it's a difficult case and want to prove it, you may actually be lucky and do the molecular and um, detect this appropriate fusion and make the right diagnosis. Now, there are other more less expensive, although not as specific, but less expensive tools you can use if you suspect that this is the tumor to use them as surrogate markers for um, uh, the underlying fusion, because the fusion itself produces a protein, right? Um, and uh, there are now immunoxochemical stains, which are relatively good from a specificity point of view, and uh, you can use it as a surrogate marker. And uh, YAP1 yep, yep has C-terminus and the N-terminus, so yep, immunoxtochemistry detects the protein, right? So the normal protein has a C-terminus and N-terminus, right? And it can be expressed in different normal, different, um, normal tissues. And um, when you have this fusion, uh, because 
when the two genes are fused, you don't have the whole genes together, right? You're losing part of the genes, and that's how the fusion is created. So when the YAP1 is fused with the MAMEL2, it actually loses that part of the gene that translates uh, for the end for the C terminus. So if you actually want to check the C terminus, it's going to be lost. All right. So you see here that red form and composite hemangioma, you don't have any stain with the C terminus YAP1 immunohistochemistry because it was actually lost. So that is a surrogate marker that you have a fusion with a YAP1. Of course, it's not super specific. A lot of other tumors have YAP1 fusion, but um, with the YAP1, if you're in the appropriate morphologic test setting, you may actually make the correct diagnosis without having to do molecular status. It's a new immunoxochemistry you can actually work. Now, the other new thing is that composite hemangioma, some of them can show neuroendocrine marker expression. And what do I mean by that? I mean, staining for neuroendocrine markers, uh, such as synaptophysin or CD56. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to use the term neuroendocrine differentiation, but it didn't stain for chromogranin, et cetera, but it stains for some neuroendocrine markers. And they have found remarkably that some of these composite hemangioenthliomas, although the majority of them, they are of intermediate malignancy, meaning they don't metastasize frequently, the ones that they show neuroendocrine expression, they actually behave aggressively. And this is an example of composite hemangioenthlioma. This particular had this area has retiform hemangioenthlioma pattern, but and CD31 is a stain that proves to be a vascular neoplasm, and it was diffusely positive for synaptophysin. And another area here, we kind of resemble retiform or a um, hobnail hemangioma. Uh, it was going around the nerve. This was a big nerve surrounding the nerve, and it was actually synaptophysin uh, positive as well. Uh, so, so I do it now just to uh, make sure because, I mean, it's very early. We don't have a lot of cases, but it seems that for some reason that it's unknown, we don't know, perhaps uh, so far, many of these composite hemangiotheliomas with uh, uh, neuroendocrine expression, they may actually behave aggressively. So you may actually tingle your therapy or how do you, how are you going to follow up this patient uh, in case uh, this tumor behaves aggressively? All right, we're going to uh, take a break for uh, five, seven minutes. Let me. All right, so. We will continue with the um, one second. All right, we'll continue now with uh, another fascinating tumor called pseudomyogenic hemangioenthelioma. Pseudomyogenic hemangioenthelioma is a fascinating tumor that is also a tumor of intermediate malignancy. And um, you get, if you don't hear me, please send me a message. <clears throat> and um, it typically affects, for some reason, we don't really understand um, adult uh, <clears throat> males. The uh, ratio between males and females is four to one. And it's it's rare, but you certainly see cases of pseudomyogenic hemangioenthelioma and has intermediate biologic potential. Again, the definition has a propensity for local recurrence and uh, and uh, a frequent development of additional nodules in the same region. That's very common, and metastasis is rare. So the first thing you do if somebody if I diagnose a case for pseudomyogenic hemangioenthelioma. The first thing you do is actually to do a PET scan or to see a, a additional nodules in the same area because it can involve different planes. So it can involve the skin, the, uh, the soft tissue underneath the fascia, the bone itself. So you can see the distribution and, and uh, what planes the pseudomyogenic hemangioglioma involves. In general, conservative 
treatment is the mainstay of, of treatment. And the ones that I present on the skin, they look like nothing like a vascular tumor. They look like uh, bumps. You see here, it's a, it's, a, it's a bump on the skin, like a nodule. You never think that this actually may represent a vascular neoplasm of uh, intermediate uh, malignancy. But uh, if you, uh, the first thing you do again is to actually imaging the patient, because usually they just it, it is not just one nodule. You have multiple nodules that involve different planes. So you can involve the skin, as you see here, then the muscle, the bone, uh, and you have to see how extensive the disease is. And this is how classically it looks like. You have this uh, diffuse proliferation in the superficial and deep dermis. This is a follicle. This is the epidermis. And you have this proliferation of eosinophilic cells with a kind of short fascicular pattern, short fascicles with a significant eosinophilic cytoplasm, means a lot of pink cytoplasm. And again, this tumor, this is the epidermis, involves all the way down to the deep dermis and it's transected at the base. And it looks very pink. Uh, it involves the collagen bundles. As you see here, this more pink stuff, it's background collagen bundles. And it kind of look like a rhabdoid appearance, like a skeletal muscle appearance. And uh, some areas look more fascicular, as you see here. Some areas look a little bit more epithelioid, but resembling a myogenic neoplasm. And very characteristically, you see this small cell here. These are neutrophils. For some reason, we don't really understand. This probably has to do with cytokines that are excreted by the tumor. It attracts neutrophils. So in about half of the cases of pseudomyogenic hematogenothelioma, um, you can actually see these neutrophils and it can act as a, um, uh, it can act as a um, clue that you're dealing with this uh, diagnosis. This tumor is characteristically positive for keratin, so it can be misdiagnosed, some kind of carcinoma, carcinoma stain with keratin, CK keratin, that, that's a keratin cocktail, uh, but it's a vascular neoplasm. Uh, that's why it stains consistently with ERG. And CD31, which is another vascular neoplasm, uh, its, uh, its staining is variable and it's, it's negative for CD34. You've seen this stain before with the other, with the superficial fibroblastic tumor, et cetera. So it has a, a phenotype that kind of creates diagnostic uh, confusion, but um, I think the uh, CD31 positivity, ERG positivity, in conjunction with the morphology and the keratin positivity can actually point you to the right uh, diagnosis. The differential diagnosis based on the morphology, and it's important differential because these tumors have different biologic potential, is between uh, a spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. You know, it's keratin positive, it looks spindle, it looks pink, like squamous cell carcinomas do, uh, but that's a totally, totally different diagnosis. Cellular benign fibrous histiocytoma, that's another important distinction because cellular benign fibrous histiocytomas are benign tumors. Uh, well, pseudomyogenic hemangiotheliomas are malignant tumors, intermediate malignancy, not very aggressive, but they can uh, involve different planes. They have got completely different um, treatment and, and uh, clinical management where cellular benign fibrous histiocytoma, it's a benign tumor that you may re-excise, you may not. Smooth muscle neoplasm, because they look spindle and fascicular and pink, uh, but the distinction here is easy, easy because smooth muscle neoplasm will actually stain uh, for smooth muscle markers. And epithelial hemangiotheliomas is another uh, differential, which is important because epithelial hemangiotheliomas, it's a fully malignant vascular neoplasm. We're gonna talk a little bit and that distinction is important. Now, in difficult cases, what we have what we have found in pseudomyogenic hemangiotheliomas is these tumors have also a recurrent fusion that involves consistently the gene called FOS B. It has different partners. The half of the cases have this partner, serpine one, where the other half of the cases have uh, uh, another partner called ACTB, um, ACTB um, 
partner. So this is the most common, it's about half and half. But we actually know now that, except for these very common partners, the other fusions that involved in pseudomagia and hemangio and glioma, one of them we discovered, the CLTC, but WWTR1, EGFF, EGFL7, POTE, different partners, but the common theme is that all the cases have FOS B, right? And as I show you, FOS B, we have uh, fluorescent in cytohabitization test, fish test, or you have immunohistochemistry. Um, so you can actually, there are ways to actually prove that you're dealing with the pseudomyogenic hemangioma glioma, despite the fact that the partners are promiscuous. They have different partners. So it's more <coughs> an immunohistochemistry uh, called false B immunohistochemistry and has been studied uh, to see how useful and how sensitive and specific is in cases of pseudomyogenic hemangioma. And this was uh, a study from uh, Japan. Uh, you see here that all the pseudomyogenic hemangioma has 100% and strong expression of FOSB. FOSB is this brown nuclear staining. It's very clean. Where other tumors that there were potentially the differential, such as epithelial hemangioma, angiosarcoma, Kaposi sarcoma, epithelial sarcoma, they have zero or very weak focal positivity, which is not interpreted as positive, where diffuse strongly positivity was only in the tumors of pseudomyogenic hemangioma glioma. And this was actually another study from Boston with more cases, but you could see here that 96% of 48 out of 50, the uh, pseudomyogenic hemangioma glioma had positivity. And the two cases that were negative, they were from bone, which was declassified and it probably was a technical, a false negative rather than a, uh, 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 rather than a uh, true negative. A lot of other tumors that you see here in the differential were negative. One case of epithelial angiosarcoma, in retrospect, it's probably not an epithelial angiosarcoma. And we'll talk about this a little bit. And uh, other entities, nodular fasciitis, peripheral fasciitis, have positivity, but these entities will never be differential morphologically, so that's not a problem. The other thing was interesting is that half of the cases of benign vascular neoplasm, so-called epithelial hemangioma, they're actually positive. So when you see this kind of result, two things can happen, or <clears throat> the stain is crap, you know, the, the, sense, the, the specificity is not very good, or there is a biologic explanation of why half of epithelial hemangiomas were actually staining positive. And actually there is a biologic definition. And uh, because, a lot of the epithelial hemangiomas have force B rearrangements as well. So force B rearrangement is not going to tell you definitely if you don't have the morphology, you're dealing with a pseudomyogenic hemangioma glioma. The force B is seen in epithelial hemangiomas as well. So it really shows you that molecular data cannot replace more conventional methods of assessment and you need to correlate it's another data point. You need to correlate the molecular data with the <clears throat> protein expression data, the immunohistochemical data, with the morphology data, with the clinical data, with the radiology data, and put all these together and make a diagnosis, right? So I don't just look slides. I, if I have to, I will look the radiology, I would look the clinical, right, to actually make a more informed, appropriate diagnosis. It's not, you have to put everything, everything together. And it's important because there are potentially treatments that work in hemangio, in pseudomyogenic hemangio glioma. And this was a, a, a more aggressive pseudomyogenic hemangio glioma where um, actually responded to telatinib which telatinib is a, um, um, an F F e a VEGFR uh, uh, inhibitor. And uh, because of that fusion, creates some kind of feedback look, which is um, dependent on 
VGF PDGFR signaling. And teladinib is a VGFR inhibitor. And actually, that's how mechanistically pseudomyogenic hemangioma responded to teladinib. So it's very important, therefore, to make the appropriate diagnosis because you may have a targeted treatment for cases that they don't behave in a needle and fashion. Now, moving on to malignant vascular tumors, I told you, I talked to you about intermediate malignant and a fully malignant low grade vascular tumor is epithelial hemangioma. It's a rare low grade malignant vascular neoplasm that shows endothelial differentiation because of vascular tumor and uh, is malignant, but it's less aggressive than angiosarcoma. The risk of metastasis is approximately 20 to 30 percent of cases, so it's it's way above 5 percent. Therefore, it's fully malignant. It's not intermediate malignancy, and the death is approximately 50 percent of the cases. Now, it depends on the anatomic location. If you have an epithelial hemangioma that is purely on the skin, it behaves less aggressively comparing to an epithelial hemangioma that you have in the lung or in the liver, which are common locations to get epithelial hemangioma. But of course, I'm a dermatopathologist as well, and you can see a continuous epithelial hemangioma. It's very well described and uh, <clears throat> affects patients of all ages, but it's rare to see that in children. And usually, uh, it's a solitary lesion. It's one bump, but it can involve larger pre-existing vessels. So if you see multiple cutaneous nodules and you biopsy and you have a diagnosis of epithelial hemangioendothelioma, think about a metastasizing deep soft tissue or osseous epithelial hemangioendothelioma that involves larger vessels and throws emboli to the skin, right? So if you have multiple epithelial hemangioma, you have to look very hard uh, because you may have a primary somewhere else, and you, what you just see is cutaneous tumor emboli. And this is a classic case of epithelial hemangioma. This again is on the skin. This is the epidermis. This is the fat. This is eccrine glands. This is the dermis, and this is the tumor. And you have these epithelioid cells with kind of prominent nucleoli, pink, uh, arranging in uh, single cells or in seeds of uh, epithelioid cells in a mix of hyaline background and sometimes they have vascular lumina which may or may contain red blood cells and this is primitive vascular differentiation you're not going to see an epithelial hemangioendothelioma full vascular spaces if you see that you're probably dealing with a different tumor but you're going to see intracytoplasmic uh, lumina containing may which may contain erythrocytes, which is primitive vascular differentiation. Some of the tumors less commonly on the skin, but more commonly on deeper location, they have a angiocentric growth pattern, right? This is epidermis, this is dermis, this eccrine glands, this is a vessel, and the tumor grows around the vessel. It's not as common in the skin, it's more common in other anatomic locations, but they have this angiocentric and that can be actually helpful diagnostically when you see that to point you in the right direction. And again, it's composed of small epithelioid cells in a mixoid hyaline background, and you see this intracytoplasmic lumina. And a high power around the vessel, again, this intracytoplasmic lumina. Now, the caveat here and the potential pitfall is that epithelial hemangioendotheliomas can actually stain for keratin, right? I told you that pseudomyogenic hemangioma stain for keratin, and this is a pitfall because if you if I saw only, only that, you may actually think about a metastasis from a lobular breast cancer. It doesn't look very different. And breast cancers are positive for keratin, so you may actually misdiagnose some kind of uh, carcinoma or a, a metastatic carcinoma where in fact, you're dealing with a primary vascular tumor. So you need to think about doing the vascular markers. Uh, and if you think about them, 
despite the fact that one quarter of the cases have keratin positivity, uh, the vascular markers are positive because we're dealing with the vascular neoplasm, and therefore you can actually make the appropriate diagnosis. Now, what do we know about the molecular? The molecular, we know that epithelial hematogenic glioma has a recurrent translocation involving chromosomes one and three, which involves WWTR1 and CAMTA1 gene. Now, this is seen in approximately 90% of the cases and can be very helpful uh, if you want to confirm that histologic, morphology, uh, molecularly, or if a difficult case. Um, and a subset of them actually will show a different kind of fusion, uh, YAP1 TFE3. And you're already familiar with the YAP1 gene because you show this gene uh, in the uh, composite and retiform hematogenic glioma. So it just shows you the promiscuity of these genes, not just the genes, but the gene, the whole gene fusions as well. So molecular cannot replace, cannot give you definitive answers, cannot replace pathology. You have to assess the molecular data in combination with the morphology and other data. But uh, if you don't have <clears throat> molecular, you can actually, there is now an immunohistochemical stain in the marker, CAMTA1, which is very useful, a nuclear marker, a clean marker, which can act as a surrogate marker for the underlying fusion. The same way that the YAP1 C terminus that I talked to you about was acting as a surrogate marker for the underlying fusion. And people have studied that, and you see that in a great majority of epithelial hemangioendothelioma, glioma, they actually stain for this marker. This was an epithelial hemangioendothelioma. We see this cell, the single cells are actually the neoplastic cells in a single cells in a mixture haline background with intracytoplasmic lumina. And you can see here that the CAMTA1 stains the neoplastic cells where the background non-neoplastic cells, such as the endothelial cells, fibroblasts, uh, dendritic cells, etc., they're negative because that they're not the neoplasm. The neoplasm is the one that actually stain positive for CAMTA1. All right, and it works very well. And actually, one case which was called epithelial angiosarcoma, in retrospect, the authors believe that this actually was a case of epithelial hemangioendothelioma, which is high grade. And I will talk a little bit about this. This is another example of epithelial hemangioendothelioma in the lung. This is lung alveoli, and this is the tumor with the myxohyaline background. And you see here that the alveoli and the histiocytes and all the long non-neoplastic cells that are negative, where the truly neoplastic cells are staying positive. And this was an epithelial hemangioendothelioma in the liver. This eosinophilic cytoplasm, they're all background liver cells that they don't stain with the stain, but these univocular cells in the background of the liver cells are actually po positive, and these are the truly neoplastic cells. And people have looked at sensitivity and specificity, and this was another study from Japan. You see here that 14 out of 16 cases were positive, where a lot of other tumors that they were in the differential were negative. But of course, things get more complicated, and we now know that epithelial hemangioendothelioma, you can have WWTR1 gene fusions with other partners apart from CAMTA1, and especially the ones that are associated with cardiac involvement. So you see here that the partner has is MAMEL2, ACTL6A, WWTR1. So if you do the immunohistochemistry CAMTA1 as a surrogate marker, you're going to get a negative result. So that doesn't mean it's not an epithelial hemangioglioma. So the specificity of this is actually not 100% for biological reasons that I just explained you. So to prove that, you actually want to need to do molecular if you need to prove that, but you need to be aware of this possibility. And of course, again, these genetic events are not are promiscuous, are not categorical for this diagnosis. <clears throat> so you need to uh, put everything together. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
because there is a detection of CAM TA1, W type number one in a myelolipoma, okay, which is a completely benign tumor, has nothing to do with epithelial hemangioma. So if you just think that you're going to put that thing in the machine and it gives you the fusion and you're going to have an answer, um, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so you just have to, uh, the pathologist has to put everything together uh, to make the most correct diagnosis. The other subtype of epithelial hemangioendothelioma, which is different from your classic epithelial hemangioendothelioma, is the one with YAP1 TFE3. And again, the YAP1, you've seen this gene before, but you have not seen the partner. And these tumors look a little bit different. I told you that the epithelial hemangioendothelioma doesn't have well-formed vascular spaces. It has primitive endothelial differentiation. On the contrary, epithelial hemangioendothelioma with YAP1 TFE3 can show vascular channels, and the cells look different. They look larger, they have more eosinophilic pink cytoplasm, and they are positive for vascular markers because they are vascular neoplasms. And this is a surrogate marker for the underlying TFE3 fusion. It's a TFE3 immunohistochemical stain that stains diffusely positive for um, TFE3 because it has the underlying YAP1 TFE3 fusion. And this is another case of YAP1 TFE3 epithelial hemangioendothelioma, diffusely positive for CD31, diffusely positive for TFE3, but negative for CAMTA1. And the epithelial hemangioendotheliomas that have YAP1 TFE3, you can use the TFE3 as a surrogate marker, but sometimes it's not the best stain. And you can use, of course, the same way that you use it for retiform and composite hemangioendothelioma, you can actually use it for um, as a surrogate marker for a YAP1 fusion in cases for epithelial hemangioendothelioma, and with pretty good results, not perfect. You see here that in 13 cases that they have diffusion, in 10 cases, not all of them, but in 10 cases, uh, there was loss of the C terminus of YAP-T1 because presumably the C terminus was lost in the YAP-1 TFE3 fusion. Therefore, the protein with that, and with that epitope was not being expressed. And this is another case of YAP-1 TFE3 hemangioendothelioma, which was negative for YAP1 uh, C terminus, right? With good internal positive control. So the cells that they don't have diffusion because the, the uh, background non-neoplastic cells are actually positive where the tumor itself is negative. And uh, that is a surrogate marker that you have an underlying YAP1 fusion, which in conjunction with the morphology, it looks like a vascular tumor and a couple of stains you can actually make the accurate diagnosis without having to do more sophisticated, expensive, and slower molecular studies. Now, the question is, epithelial hemangioendothelioma, it's, it's a malignant with a classic fusion. How is the epithelial hemangioendothelioma with YAP1 TFE3? How do they behave? And uh, there are not many cases, right? It's very rare, very rare. So you cannot have tons of uh, cases, but people manage to uh, um, gather a lot of these cases and uh, show that a large proportion of patients who are actually, uh, even with metastatic disease, survive for many years, even, with, if, even if they have widespread metastasis. And the um, progression free survival and the overall survival was actually the five year free progression free survival over survival. It was actually better, much better than your conventional epithelial hemangioendothelioma. So, from the limited data that we have so far, appears that these patients can actually um, live for many years uh, under stable disease even if they have widespread metastatic disease, which is contrary to your classic epithelial hemangioendothelioma. But of course, I told you that you cannot put the, the thing in the machine and gives you a, um, the result and you have a diagnosis because they exactly the same fusion, exactly the same fusion, YAP-TFE3 
is recurrent and characteristic of a completely different tumor in the lung, the so-called um, clear cell stroma tumor of the lung, a very rare tumor in the lung, which is completely different with a different behavior. We just show you the promiscuity of these genetic events, and you cannot do it without conventional morphology. Your pathologist is not going away soon. So uh, it's molecular along with the other is just another data point will help us build the entire picture. And of course, things get even more complicated uh, that it's very rare, but there are tumors that actually have TFE3 and CAMTA1 gene rearrangements together. What are these, right? Nobody knows. You have to go back to morphology and see how they look like, but that's an extraordinary, extraordinary event. Now, what is the prognostic stratification, right? What does it matter? How you inform the patients? What do you look for these cases to see which cases, are, which patients uh, they have higher chances to uh, behave better the tumor, or in which cases you think they may actually be more aggressive. Overall, as I told you, patients with conventional epithelial hemangioma glioma and WWTR1 CAMTA1 fusion have a less favorable outcome for the epithelial hemangioma glioma with YAP1 TFE3, right? So that's important. So if I had this tumor, I want to know. I would I want to know. I would pay to have molecular. I want to know if I have a YAP1 TFE3 or a WWTR1 if the pathologist couldn't tell me. Because the overall five-year overall survival was the YAP1 TFE3 has 59% five-year overall survival, where the epithelial, the classic epithelial hemangioma glioma, 86, uh, and uh, sorry, 59, the other way around. So it's a big difference. And uh, the soft tissue epithelioid hemangioma endotheliomas, the classic, that um, they were solitary, right? You have a bump in the skin or just one, one tumor. Um, they follow a more indolent clinical course and they're often managed by curative surgery. You have one tumor, one bump. But if you have multifocality, if you have multiple epithelial tumor, multiple fo multifocality, epithelial hemangioma epithelial in multiple locations, if you have plural involvement, which is not uncommon, if you have multifocality, plural involvement, uh, lymph node involvement, or distant metastasis, then the outcome was significantly worse. This actually was dropping, of, was dropping to, and it was equivalent to high grade sarcomas with 20 to 30% five year survival, right? A big difference. All these prognostic factors matter and they're important for the pathologist to report them so you can actually have a sense uh how aggressive this tumor will be and uh, if i see a tumor can i stratify the risk i told you that in composite hematophilioma cases with synaptophysin expression they may behave more aggressively, right? That's, that's although we don't have a lot of cases, that's risk stratification. I'm giving you information about risk. So people have looked at this and say, okay, which cases, which are the risk factors that a, a case will behave more aggressively or not? Um, another paper looked a little bit different in terms of the histology and found that if the tumor is large, if the tumor is more than three centimeters, that then the five year survivor rate was dropped significantly. Histologically, does it look typical? And I will see what we mean by typical or atypical. And they get a scoring system that puts the patients in three different categories, which is a proposed three tiered risk model using tumor size and histologic features to categorize the patient into low, intermediate, and high risk groups where the five-year survival was 100% in the low risk, was 81.8% in the intermediate category, 
and was dropping significantly to 16.9% in the high risk, right? So that's important. And how do I make that distinction between typical and atypical? I look at the tumor and I'm looking for three things. How many mitosis I have per 10 square high power square millimeter, high power fields, two square millimeters. If I have one, more than one, it gets one point. What is the nuclear grade? Does it look bland or it looks a higher nuclear grade morphologically? That would give me one point. And is there a coagulative type necrosis? So if you get uh, two out of three, then you get one point in the atypical. And if you have more than three centimeters, then you're in the high risk. Or if you want one point in the medium risk, et cetera. It's a really good paper. It gives you a sense of risk and how aggressively you're going to manage your patient, how aggressively you're going to um, follow, uh, you're going to um, um, imaging the patient, follow up with the patient and give them, even if you don't do any of that stuff, give your patient prognostic information. It's very important. We uh, do not just do operations, not just treat patients, but we need to talk about prognosis as well. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a different thing to talk about prognosis without data, which is basically garbage. And it's a different thing to talk with your patients about prognosis with data, okay? And this is uh, a case of um, a high-risk epithelial hemangioma glioma it was more than three centimeters. Um, it was looking high-grade nuclear. You see these nuclear features are not your bland uh, tumor. And then this tumor happens to have, have synaptophysin. Synaptophysin, we didn't. It, wouldn't, it were very, very few cases. You couldn't do a statistical analysis. Uh, but the cases that had synaptophysin, the, um, the case that behaved aggressively, uh, some of the cases had the synaptophysin expression. Uh, as well, and uh, people have got it's a it's a rare cancer. We see that if you I mean, uh, uh, practice in a major center uh, specializing in bone shift pathology, but you see that you see you'll see these cases uh, depending on your field. And uh, people got together from uh, United States and Europe, pathologists and Australia, I think, uh, pathologists, radiologists, oncologists, surgeons, radiotherapists. And put this um, excellent review about epithelial hemangioma, which gives you information about each specialty and how to handle this very rare um, tumor. Now, to a tumor that you may be a little bit more familiar, angiosarcoma, which is very aggressive, high grade tumor, and angiosarcoma arises in four typical clinical settings. You have the angiosarcomas are common in the face or the scalp, and they happen in a chronically sun damaged skin. You have sporadic visceral angiosarcomas. You have angiosarcomas that happen in the setting of chronic lymphedema, for example, in, a, in the old days after radical mastectomy. And then most commonly, by way more commonly these days, is you have secondary angiosarcomas for in the field of previous irradiation for whatever reason, for carcinoma, for sarcoma, whatever reason, if you can have po secondary post-radiation angiosarcomas in the radiation field. And uh, when you get radiation, you can have angiosarcomas, but you can have indolent vascular proliferations that, it, that nothing happens to the patients and we call them AVLs, atypical vascular proliferations in the area of private radiation. And your main job here, because the stakes are huge, is to try to distinguish a secondary angiosarcoma from a atypical vascular lesion, an AVL. And it's not easy sometimes. It's not easy at all, especially on small samples. There are some ways to get out of this. And uh, we know now that MIC, which MIC is a proto-oncogene, which is located in chromosome 8 and it's trans transcriptional factor. And we know now that the majority of secondary angiosarcomas, either because of irradiation or because of lymphedema, both of them are secondary angiosarcomas, they have consistent MIC amplification with the subsequent, because the, the gene is amplified, 
you have overexpression of the protein that actually you can detect that with immunohistochemistry. So you have nuclear expression of MIC, which is rarely seen in primary angiosarcomas, and it's not seen in atypical vascular lesions, which is your main differential with angiosarcoma. So MIC high-level gene amplification is a distinctive feature of secondary angiosarcomas after irradiation or chronic lipidition that are not seen in a typical vascular lesion. And uh, very commonly you see these angiosarcomas uh, in the breast because the breast carcinoma is so common and so, so many people get adjuvant radiation uh, that most commonly you see a secondary angiosarcoma at the breast in the setting of um, post radiation. And, um, and the majority of the cases show MIC amplification. And you can test for this MIC amplification by immunohistochemistry, which is a bit tricky because it doesn't work that well all the time, or more easily and very importantly to do fluorescence in situ hybridization to assess for MIC amplification. And this is a secondary angiosarcoma to g radiation. So this is the tumor here that grows in between the collagen bundles, which is this um, eosinophilic background. And this is MIC amplification. So you have a lot of protein expression because you have a lot of copies of the gene. And that's why it's detected by the immunostochemistry. And if you do FIS, you see a lot of red. The red is the probe for the gene and the green is the probe for the centromere. So that means that I have amplification of the area where is the MIC. I don't have I don't have polyploidy. I don't have a lot of chromosomes. The MIC is in location of chromosome eight. I don't have a lot of chromosomes eight. I have that which means polyploidy. If I had polyploidy, I will have a lot of red and a lot of green signals. That is not amplification. Amplification is I have I don't have polyploidy. I have one, I have two, right? I have two chromosomes eight but I have a lot of MIC genes because it, the area where the MIC gene is located is amplified and I can throw the probe in that particular area. That's why I get a lot of red signals, right? MIC amplification. And this is a difficult case. Many times you get this pants biopsy, difficult pants biopsies. This is actually a subtle angiosarcoma infiltrating into the collagen bundles, which stains diffusely positive for MIC and kind of resemble an atypical vascular lesion, where this is very difficult. This actually resembles a benign atypical vascular lesion, but actually it is a atypical vascular lesion like angiosarcoma because they are actually positive here for uh for the um for the MIC. All right. Where here is a true AVL, which is benign, and yet yeah, there's nothing to do, and uh, the MIC is completely negative, and uh, uh, you see here it has an internal positive control. The epidermis is working, so that's very important because if you suspect an angiosarcoma and you do a couple of biopsies, and the pathologist tells you it's a post radiation angiosarcoma, the next thing is mastectomy. Okay, if they haven't done it, let's see on the breast. Well, if you do an AVL, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to watch this patient, right? So the, the stakes are huge. Uh, so that's why the, uh, we are very careful with these cases and you have to make the appropriate uh, diagnosis. Now, you can have MIC amplification in primary angiosarcomas. That is uncommon. Uh, but most of the primary angiosarcomas do not have MIC amplification. So you should not use the MIC. Uh, in the setting of primary angiosarcomas, but you should use you should use it as an adjuvant test, trying to resolve a problem in cases that you're questioning if you have a secondary angiosarcoma. That means in cases of uh, in the radiation bed or in uh, lymphedema cases, or in cases that they had a previous graft. Sometimes you get angiosarcomas in cases that had a previous synthetic graft. So MIC immunohistochemistry is therefore useful in differentiating atypical or benign vascular lesions occurring in irradiated skin from secondary post-radiation angiosarcomas. And we actually put a study together 
uh, when is appropriate to use MIC. Uh, the American Society of Dramatic Pathology was I had the honor to uh, chair, and uh, we putting uh, test scenarios and guidelines uh, for when it's appropriate to use ancillary diagnostic test and which scenario. And one of the tests that we chose it was when it's appropriate to use MIC uh, fish or MIC immuno uh, to make the correct diagnosis. Right? For example, if you're looking for primary angiosarcomas, it would not be appropriate. If you look for secondary, it would be appropriate, etc. Um, so there's a lot of um, dynamism and a lot of progress has been done in the uh, classification of vascular tumors uh, the last 10 years or so, and that is reflected on the new WHO uh, that was published two years ago. And you can see here that <clears throat> benign intermediate malignancy or fully malignant tumors have um, different molecular genetic alterations that actually uh, they can help you potentially making the right diagnosis if you need them. You don't you don't need them in the majority of the cases, but there are some cases that the pathologist needs them to make the appropriate um, diagnosis. But of course, as I told you, all these events are promiscuous, <clears throat> and this EWS R1, NFA TC1, two fusions, uh, which are known to occur in a completely different category of neoplasms, uh, the round cell sarcomas that can actually be seen in a unique epithelial vascular neoplasm of bone, which is not yet in the WHO book, but gathering more cases maybe, uh, with EWSR1, FAS, uh, NFTA, C1, and 2 fusions. So this is an excellent review for if we have any pathologists in the audience here, uh, from Jason Horton, what is new in endothelial neoplasia. Now, moving on to um, undifferentiated round cell sarcomas. And the prototype of undifferentiated round cell sarcomas is Ewing sarcoma. <clears throat> that is the most common uh, that it was tackled first. Uh, and this is a classic case of Ewing sarcoma with these monomorphous uh, round cell cells that they are diffusely positive in a membranous pattern for CD99, and they show also diffuse positivity for PAC7. And EWS R1, <clears throat> yeah, Ewing sarcoma has characteristically EWS R1 fly one or EWS R1 erg or other ETS gene family partners. The most common is EWS R1 fly one. And then a lot of work has been done in undifferentiated round cell sarcomas that are not Ewing. And, that's, and that has been since 2015, there was an explosion of data. And now we know and is recognized uh, under the new WHO that the undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas, uh, they actually um, are distinct entities. Now, what other undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas that they are not Ewing? They have a round cell morphology, which is similar to Ewing sarcoma, but they lack they don't have EWSR1 ETS rearrangements, and they don't show any other signs of a specific line of differentiation. And uh, the most common of the non-Ewing undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas is the CIC rearranged sarcoma. That's the most common. It's commoner than you think. And the most common fusion is the CIC DAX4, and the CIC rearranged sarcomas are at least 70% um, of the non Ewing sarcoma. And it's very important to diagnose it correctly. It's very important because CIC DAX4, CIC rearranged sarcomas have a behave more aggressively than Ewing. They are more aggressive and they don't respond to the chemo protocol that we use for Ewing. We use the chemo protocol for Ewing because we have nothing better to do, but they are less responsive and they behave more aggressively. The second WHO recognized category is the sarcoma with B core genetic alterations. And then more rarely we have round cell sarcomas with EWS R1 non ETS fusions. Now, the sarcomas with CIC rearranged sarcomas, which I told you are the most common uh, entity other than Ewing of the undifferentiated small round cell sarcoma, 
there was a huge study from my colleague Christina Andonescu, which was pivotal to make it a distinct entity. And characteristically, not the majority of the cases, not all of them, have translocation involving chromosome 4 and 19, involving CIC DAX4, and translocation involving 10 and 19, involving CIC and DAX4 ERL. And they have a distinct transcriptional signature <clears throat> with poor clinical outcomes. Okay, they don't respond well to chemo. They have a wide age range from 6 to 81 years old. And most commonly, they are present in young adults. We, we can see it in a widespread age bracket. And most of them are in the soft tissue. And they split evenly between extremities and pelvis trunk. And rare, more rarely, you're going to see it in visceral organs. And extremely rarely, less than 5%, you're going to see it arising as primary uh, tumor in the bone, which is in stark contrast where the majority of Ewing sarcomas are in are osseous are in the bone with and less frequency being extra osseous and with CIC DAX4 rearranged sarcomas they have a frequent dissemination site um, in advanced cases and this is classic case of CIC uh, rearranged sarcoma they have this multi-lobulated growth pattern that can look a little bit spindly uh, they have Characteristically, a lot of areas that look more mixoid and they look very epithelioid round, but they don't look as uniform as the Ewing, which, and they look, the cells have different sizes and they look a little bit more uh, bigger. The nuclear, they, they have a little bit of nuclear, irregular nuclear contours. They look more atypical in your, your typical uh, Ewing sarcoma. Um, and again, you see here that these cells have. Um, uh, variable chromatin patterns who can be a uh, either fine chromatin pattern <clears throat> or hyperchromatic and dark or vesicular chromatin pattern with uh, some kind of variability in nuclear size and shape which is in contrast with the ewing sarcoma and uh, very commonly they can have a mixoid stroma with intervening fibrous stroma in between and uh, they can have areas of hemorrhage or necrosis. Now, because of the CIC DAX4 fusion, the molecular signature is that you have upregulation of the uh, transcriptional factors of WT1 and ETV1, 4, and 5, all right? And especially ETV4, which the ETV1, 4, and 5 are members of the PEA3 subgroup in the ETS transcription factor family, right? So the molecular characteristic signatures should have upregulation of these two. And uh, you can actually exploit that diagnostically as a screening marker. So this is cases of um, uh, CIC rearranged sarcomas that you see here that um, the CD99 can be. Um, it's not always diffusely and strongly positive in a membranous fashion, as you see in Ewing. I have different partners, but WT1 positivity is not that common in Ewing. So WT1 is a good marker for if you're dealing with a round cell sarcoma to start suspecting that you may have a CIC rearranged sarcoma. And there is actually an ETV4 immunostochemical stain. And I told you that ETV4 is upregulated in CIC rearranged sarcoma. You can exploit that uh, diagnostically as well. And you see here the great majority of CIC rearranged sarcomas were positive, where a lot of other tumors, um, they were negative uh, that could be potentially in the differential. And you can have the uh, immuno or not. there is RNA in cytocarbidization. I show you the PDGFB RNA in cytochrabidization. Uh, so you have ETV1, 4, and 5 RNA in cytochrabidization uh, that can be helpful. They are positive in CIC DAX sarcomas and they can be helpful diagnostically. And actually, it may actually be even more sensitive than molecular studies because CIC rearranged sarcoma, sometimes you get a false negative fish or false negative NGS for various technical reasons that I don't have time to go over. So it actually can be more uh, sensitive. And if you have CIC4, CIC DAX4, 
Not all of them are DEX4, but the majority are. There's also a DEX4 immunohistochemical stain that actually appears to work really well and stain the trimmers for uh, uh, even uh, even the ones that they, you, you, you got neoadjuvant chemo uh, where other tumors within the differential diagnosis uh, did not stain for uh, DAX4. And these were all uh, five examples in the paper. These were all CIC DAX4 undifferentiated round cell sarcomas uh, that they show positivity for DAX4 irrespectively if uh, it was post-treatment or pre-treatment. Okay, doesn't really matter if they had neoadjuvant or not, they still retain the DAX4 even extochemical. But of course, it, it's not gonna capture all of them. The great majority of CIC rearranged sarcomas have DAX4 uh, partner, but there are other rare that they have other partners. For example, one is FOXO4. Uh, so if you do the DAX4 immuno, it's not gonna catch it. But all of these, irrespectively of the partner, DAX4, FOXO4 or other, all of them have upregulation of WT1 and ETV1, 4, and 5. So all of them, they're going to show WT1 positivity and positivity for ETV1, 4, or 5. So you can explore that because the partners of the CIC are, um, are um, getting more and more as we uh, do more advanced molecular studies in this uh, tumor. And again, another tumor here, which was um, a round cell sarcoma with another tumor, another partner, not M2A, but still the uh, CIC, it's there. Um, it's there. It's not for long, but the, because there are other, I'm not going to talk about this, but there are other round cell sarcomas that they show exactly the same genetic signature, WT1, ETV1, 4 or 5 uh, upregulation, but they don't have CIC rearrangement. So it gets more complicated, but I'm not going to get you that because that's very, very new. And uh, all these uh, CIC rearranged sarcomas with the different partners, they actually are the same entity. They're not other stuff. They're all, in this amazing paper from France, <clears throat> they're all landed together uh, in the transcriptomic analysis. And this is uh, this uh, picture that you see here. It's a T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding analysis, TSNE. And you see here that all the all the tumors here clustered together, where other tumors uh, that uh, they cluster differently. So that means they're the same entity and not something else. And of course, you know, it gets expanded, and a lot of uh, CIC rearranged sarcomas uh, are seen in the central nervous system. And uh, we have some new fusions, and I'm pretty sure more will come in the future. And uh, but it's not specific, you know. Again, you have to see the slide. Pathologies, all good pathologies, not going away anytime soon, because round cell sarcomas, one of the differential is lymphoma. And uh, if you think you're going to put it in the machine and give you the answer, we are not correct. Um, because lymphomas, they are rare. There are some subtype of pediatric B cell lymphoblast lymphoblastic leukemia that show DAX4 rearranged. If you do extra to secrecy, it's going to DAX4 rearranged cell sarcoma, right? And the same thing, EWSR1 DAX4 can actually has been seen rarely in a in a case of embryonal rhabdo. Myosarcoma, which is completely a different entity. So you have to put all the data point together. And uh, CIC DAX4 uh, actually demonstrate a MIC amplification, right? And that you show that MIC amplification, secondary angiosarcomas is not specific. This uh, MIC amplification and um, ETS family transcription factor detection expression is increased in CIC DAX4 sarcoma. So you really have to put everything together. And um, uh, this tumor can be positive for ERG and FLY1. These are used as vascular markers, right? So I told you that pseudobiogenic imaginal glioma, for example, was positive for ERG. We use it for vascular markers, but it's not specific, right? So if you're not careful, you may see, okay, ERG positive, it's a vascular tumor called angiosarcoma. Well, we may be dealing with a CIC rearranged sarcoma, which has ERG overexpression because that's what it does. So, and you have a completely wrong diagnosis with 
different natural, different treatment, different prognosis, a disaster, and potentially medical legal issues for all of them. Uh, other, the tumor can actually show some confusing positive positive. So a lot of these immunos are not specific and be positive for a lot of different things that you have very aware. And importantly, NKX22, which is the immunostain that we use uh, for Ewing sarcoma, uh, it's hopefully is negative. So um, we can actually uh, not create diagnostic confusion with Ewing. So ETV4, I told you, is expressed in a nuclear pattern and uh, rare cases can be negative. So you have to be aware of that. It's not entirely specific. Uh, so you have to be careful. And WT1 um, is positive in 75% of the cases, which can be used diagnostically. It's not a specific stain, but it can be useful in conjunction with the other uh, data. And you can use the WT1 N terminus or C terminus. So this is a case of CIC rearranged sarcoma, which shows diffuse positivity for uh, WT1 and diffuse positivity for ETV4, and so CIC rearranged. A beautiful case, a nice case of CIC rearranged sarcoma, which uh, was just diagnosed on the core bias. Now that's way difficult in Greece with the stop because of the the access that my colleagues have here to all these tools. It's quite limited, uh, but uh, you can suggest it. You don't have to have the molecular, but if you get the stains, because the stains is easier to get in Greece, they're not that expensive. Uh, and if you have the case, if you have the number of cases to use them, uh, so you can actually suspect and guide your clinicians to the appropriate direction. Now, if you do molecular, you have to be aware it's not the holy grail. And there are, uh, especially for CIC rearranged sarcomas, we know now that fluorescent in silo hybridization, which is more easily accessible in Greece because it's cheaper, um, it actually can have a false negative, right? Uh, it can have a false negative because of cryptic rearrangement and actually up to 15% of cases. So if you get a fist negative, don't give up. If you still are you highly suspicious that you may be dealing with a CIC rearranged sarcoma, so upregulation of ETV4 appears actually to be more sensitive than the fish. And uh, see here, you see here the um, survival outcomes, which is, it is bad. It's bad for uh, the CIC rearranged sarcoma uh, comparing to Ewing. Uh, the overall, the two-year overall survival is 53%. The five-year overall survival is 43%, which is uh, a, favor, a, favorable, uh, um, a favorable clinical course. And of course, if you get a metastasis, uh, it's even worse, and uh, it's way, way worse than Ewing, and we don't have good chemo for these patients. And uh, they can be done, uh, they can be seen superficially as well. This is a paper put together with my colleague, Dr. Mangelu. She was at the University of Ioana at that time, now she's in Cyprus. She sent me amazing cases when she was in Greece, and other colleagues from the United States. So they can actually be seen superficially as well. They're not as common, but they can be seen so we have to be aware of that. So a typical morphologic findings are common in CIC rearranged sarcomas. If you see it on the bone, because it's so uncommon on the bone, it's so exceptional, you, are, you have to stay, search the patient radiologically to actually search if it is a metastasis, which probably is coming from somewhere else. Nuclear expression of WT1 can be helpful, um, especially but you have to be careful with uh, the differential of desmoplastic small round cell tumor, which is uh, an entity that has WT1 rearrangements and express WT1 C terminus. And uh, a subset of uh, EWSR1 ETS or non ETS round cell sarcomas that are not CIC rearranged sarcomas can actually have high grade features. And uh, May you occasionally see other staining and create confusion for example, stains that you usually expect in carcinoma or mesothelioma. You have to be aware of that. And ERG and FLY1, which is which is positive in Ewing sarcoma as well, will not discriminate a CIC rearranged sarcoma from Ewing. And that discrimination is very important. Oncologists care about this, they care a lot because it makes a big difference to them. And uh, uh, CIC with mixture can have a lot of mixture changes. It can resemble 
other completely different entities in the differential, such as extraskeletal mixed chondrosarcoma or a myoepithelial tumor, or uh, the other way around, a sclerosing epithelial sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, which is a completely different tumor, low grade, uh, high grade uh, tumor that behaves also aggressively, but a different tumor uh, can kind of resemble CIC rearranged sarcoma, but this tumor is going to be diffused positive for MAC4. We, you, know, you don't expect that in CIC rearranged sarcoma. But on the, the other way around, too, you can have a CIC rearranged sarcoma, which kind of mimics sclerosing epithelial sarcoma. But I told you that um, the distinction is actually easy doing the MAC4 immunostochemical stain. Uh, it can look very epithelial, resembling a high grade carcinoma uh, or something like that. So that is another something that you have to be aware of that. And the new uh, the new entity, it's a SMARC A4 deficient thoracic tumor. We don't call them sarcomas anymore, but have to change this, uh, which is a very, very new thing, very aggressive. Patients die within a year um, and they're called SMARC A4 thoracic sarcomas. Um, what time is it? We're gonna take a break for five minutes. All right, so I'm going to talk to you now about this fascinating subject. Um, I'm not going to be able to finish it, but it's good to hear a couple of things about this. Um, you know, everything that stains like melanocytic tumor, like expresses melan A, HMB45, and all kinds of stuff, it doesn't mean necessarily it is a uh, melanoma or a nevus or a melanocytoma, but actually it could be a uh, mesenchymal neoplasm, which just has melanocytic differentiation. And one of them is a tumor that you, you will encounter in your career if you would have a specialty that deals with that stuff. It's rare, but it's not like crazy rare. You'll see it. it it's the old name was melanotic schwannoma. We still, it's acceptable under the new WHO. But the new name is mal mal malignant melanotic nerve seed tumor. And uh, it's a rare tumor um, of putative neural crest origin. And uh, most commonly, you're going to see that in paraspinal nerve roots or in the gastrointestinal tract. And people who get melanotic schwannomas, I'm going to use the old term because it's, it's, it's easier, um, they can actually have, they may have carnic complex. Um, and people with carnic complex, they have other stigma of carnic complex as well. Um, they can have skin pigmentary abnormalities, myxomas, endocrine or endocrine hyperactivity. And it's very important to diagnose correctly because sometimes maybe the first manifestation, what happens with patients with carnic complex, they get, they get intracardiac myxomas and they may have a sudden cardiac death. So the appropriate diagnosis, um, the appropriate diagnosis, it's important, especially if you don't know, because these people may have a cardiac, and then they have a cardiac ultrasound to see if they have cardiac myxomas, and uh, uh, and, and it's it, it's important. Um, these cases, these tumors have PR. Uh, the, the, the people with cardiac complex have characteristically mutations, um, germline mutations in the. PRAKA1A, PRKAR1A gene. And uh, the tumor, the malignant, the melanotic spanoma, what is the cell of origin? It's actually unknown, it has hybrid features, kind of look like Schwann cells and melanocytes. But the thing is, and that was, that was the reason why we uh, changed the name, is that these tumors have unpredictable behavior, right? We, we used to call them melanotic spanomas, which is, um, um, which used to be, uh, it's a benign term, melanoma is benign. And we change it. Why do we change it when about one quarter of the patients can actually show metastasis, right? Up to one quarter of the patients with tumors that they look histologically benign, right? Where we, we cannot predict how they're going to behave. It's terrible. But that's what, that's where we are at this moment. Uh, so imagine you have a tumor that looks benign and they tell you, well, we don't know exactly, but one of the four cases that develop metastasis, you probably would be appalled if that was, if you had this tumor. 
And this is a classic of uh, classic case of uh, melanotic schwannoma. Many times it grows this multinodular growth fashion. It is well circumscribed but unencapsulated. And you see here the brown stuff is a lot of melanin that produce a lot of melanin the same way like melanomas do, but this is not melanoma. And uh, the cells look um, quite spindle and they look quite bland with internuclear inclusions. In, one of these, in some other areas, they have these epithelioid features kind of resembling melanoma. And they have a lot of melanophages. They can have degenerative type atypia, as you see here, these larger cells with irregular nuclear contours, or they can resemble lipoblasts because they have very voluminous uh, cytoplasm. And characteristically, they can have zero, a few, or a lot calcifications. These are the calcifications, and we call them samomatous bodies. And uh, it doesn't matter, the, you, you know, in the old medical, in the old textbooks, when you were medical students, you may have remember that they say melanotic schwannomas with samomatous calcification are associated with cardiac complex, but that's not true. It can be seen even in sporadic cases, but if you see them, they can be actually helpful uh, diagnostically. And, uh, but of course, it can actually have a way, uh, different patterns. Uh, we can create diagnostic difficulties that can have mixoid changes, small cell pattern, ripple pattern, kind of resemble other tumors like neuroendocrine tumor, et cetera. But if you put a lot of sections uh, in conjunction with a clinical presentation, you actually see more characteristic findings. They can invade the bone or they can give metastasis uh, to uh, the lung. And uh, one of the reasons why we changed the name is that um, they behave in a malignant and unpredictable fashion. Um, and uh, the caveat is that not all of these cases are S100 positive. So if you use this marker for uh, screening, you may actually miss a few. And uh, not all of them are melanin positive, as you see here. So that is um, potential pitfalls. And you see here, that's another case of melanotic schwannoma, where the cells appear more epithelial, but they have these uh, melanin granules that you can be seen with Fontana Masson, which highlights the melanin. And uh, in the great majority of the cases, there will be S100 positive or SOX10. SOX10 is another uh, immunostochemical stain, uh, staining tumors of neural crest origin. And of course, they're going to stain for mel melanin as well. So it really stains like melanoma. It stains like melanoma, but it's not a melanoma. So that uh, people who are not trained to do that or general pathologists, they may actually easily diagnose this as primary or metastatic melanoma for known primary, where in fact, you're dealing with a melanotic schwannoma. And uh, these tumors, sporadic or not, they can have PRK, R, and 1 mutations that when it works, doesn't work all the time. The correlation of the immuno with the mutational profile is not 100%. If it works, you see loss of staining. You know, the tumor doesn't stain. That means it has a mutation. It doesn't express the protein. Now, we're terrible in predicting behavior, right? Um, people looked at this and uh, they found that if it has more than one mitotic activity per 10 high power fields, that may be a surrogate for uh, increasing my risk. But the fact of the matter in this study, about half of the cases that behave aggressively, they didn't have any mitotic figures. So we don't have the tools to predict which tumors are going to behave aggressively. So the first thing is to make the correct diagnosis. The second is to try to excise them with clear margins if you can. And the third is you follow this patient as closely as you can. Um, and inform them about this uncertainty that about one in four, they're going to develop metastasis. And so far, with what we know, there's absolutely no way to tell which patients are going to develop this metastasis or not. And melanotic schwannoma can actually be seen in uh, superficial locations as well. For example, this was an example of the valva with nice samomatous bodies here. There are very few cases that can be seen in the skin. But um uh, one thing that um let's see here yeah one thing that um you have to be aware and sorry um i mix up with the slide a little bit so the cutaneous ones they're kind of the same thing that can be seen in about half of the cases in carnic complex and the differential diagnosis it's involves different entities and some entities are totally benign like melanotic neurofibroma some entities are of intermediate malignancy like pigmented epithelial melanocytoma, 
blue nevi benign or pigmented epithelial melanoma, obviously malignant. Different tumors, different approach. It's very important to make the accurate diagnosis. And this is a uh, melanoma which rarely can have somomatous bodies. So somomatous bodies is not the holy grail. It's not going to take it definitely. It's a melanotic sphenoma. You have to look at the tumor itself. And uh, you can have some of the bodies in melanoma. And the fact of the matter is that it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between melanotic sphenoma and melanoma. There are no individual clinical pathologic features that are completely specific. So you have to put everything together. You can't just see the slide. You have to go back to the clinical. You got to see the radiology. You know, melanotic sphenoma is most commonly porovertebral. It's predominant spindle is a lot of melanin, which is not that common in melanoma. Some oma bodies that are not common in melanoma, but can be seen. And the other thing I think very helpful is if you see a lot of pleomorphism, uh, uh, if you see a lot of pleomorphism and it has low mitotic activity, it's 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 a red flag, right? Because usually melanomas with low mitotic activity, uh, you go, you're gonna actually, um, you, it's, it's unusual. So that is uh, sorry, give me one sec, please. Uh, that is uh, unusual. So that will actually um, make you think about if you're dealing with something else. And of course, detailed clinical history or careful. Dermatologic examination. So people have looked gene expression profiling, and actually it it it, it aggregates it lands differently. So the the green is schwannoma, the the blue is um, melanoma, or the red is melanoma, the blue is melanotic schwannoma. You see, it it's different from schwannoma, it's different from melanoma. It's it's a completely it's a different thing. Melanotic schwannoma, cutaneous malignant peripheral nerve um, um, tumor. And uh, and the PRKRA1 mutations, they're not the holy grail either, because there are melanomas that uh, they, ha they can have this mutation. And so, so you have to look at the tumor, because this tumor does not look like a melanotic melanoma. So this is a melanoma which shows loss of protein kinase I regulatory subunit expression, and it's not, and it's not a... Um, and, and it's not melanotic melanoma, it's actually a melanoma. And these are cases of melanocytomas with uh, PRK AR1A mutations. And uh, it's helpful here if you see the background nevus, that means it's not a melanotic sphenoma. It's a secondary event that happens. And I don't have time to go through a lot, but patients who have this pigmented epithelial melanocytoma uh, PRK AR1A inactivation, patients with truly melanocytic tumors. Uh, they can have other initial drivers, and then you get a second mutation on PRCA one a gene, and then you you get different um, uh, histologies. So that is your differential with melanotic spanoma. So mutation in PRK A one a mutation does not mean necessarily that is pigmented uh, that is melanotic spanoma. It could be other tumor that it's within the differential diagnosis. So that was one tumor. And the second tumor I'm going to talk and I will stop is uh, Picoma. Uh, Picoma perivascular epithelial cell tumor, fascinating tumor. It's a common tumor. It's a common tumor in bone and soft tissue pathology. It's a distinctive neoplastic. It arises from a distinctive neoplastic cells that uh, has no normal counterpart and it shows immunoreactivity for both melanocytic and smooth muscle markers. And there's a group of neoplasms that they show. Uh, they, are, they belong under the category of the uh, picoma. Uh, angiomyolipoma, you're going to see that if you do uh, kidney um, surgeries, clear cells, cell sugar tumor of the lung, ex extra pulmonary sites, you're going to see that if you have thoracic surgeons or lymphangiolimatosis or clear cell melanocytic tumor of the false form ligament, you're going to see that if you're dealing with a GYN, GYN cases. And uh, Rarely can be seen as a primary cutaneous lesions. And uh, this is a very good paper for primary cutaneous picomas. And the histologic features uh, are, I'm going to show you a couple of examples a bit later, but I think the characteristic of picomas, you have this, they have this dual immunophenotype, melanocytic and smooth muscle, which shows expre expression of HMP45 and Desmond muscle. 
And one stain is the most sensitive stain is the HMB 45. And the primary cutaneous, the caveat here is the primary cutaneous picomas that can be difficult in mega markers and be only positive for monocytic markers. And this is a classic case of picoma. We show this uh, characteristically granular cytoplasm, very characteristically pink to, to white, granular with this. Um, um, with this uh, um, capillaries in, in the background. Uh, it can be quite diffuse infiltrative, so we re-excise these tumors with clear margins. And again, you have this characteristic granular cell appearance, very characteristically can resemble renal cell carcinoma, and it can be positive for melanocytic markers, HLB45 or melan A, and positive for uh, Desmond, but the cutaneous one can be actually be negative for smooth muscle markers such as SMA or Desmond. Uh, and that has been nicely illustrated by a nice paper from my colleagues in University of San Francisco, who showed that the, the smooth muscle markers can be negative or focal. So if you only have positivity for monocytic markers, you can misdiagnose this as of kind of melanoma or melanocytic tumor. So the most sensitive stain, if you're going to do one, is HMB45. And uh, if you use, <clears throat> you have to be careful because they can be very pigmented, right? They can produce melanin, the picomas, or virus molecular lesions that I, I don't have time to explain, and that actually be, uh, be confused with so-called balloon cell melanoma or balloon cell melanocytic tumor, but actually this was a pigmented picoma. And the other, they can be confused if you use out-of-date stains like CD10, it can actually be confused morphologically with renal cell carcinomas, which renal cell carcinomas, we know that metastasize to the skin. So you don't want to call something that is a primary picoma as a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. That would be a disaster. And very recently has in the skin has described, has been described as cutaneous fibroma-like picoma, which is important to diagnose it because the cutaneous picomas that are not the fibroma-like subtype they are not associated with tuberous sclerosis. The uh, picomas in the kidney, they're associated with tuberous sclerosis. Picomas in the skin are not, but the cutaneous fibroma-like picoma, actually all these cases were associated with tuberous sclerosis. So that's a very important. So if you make a diagnosis of fibroma-like cutaneous picoma and the patient does not have a uh, diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis, you need to pick up the phone and talk with the clinician or put in your report because they need to search this patient for stigmata of tuberous sclerosis or the other way around. If the patient has tuberous sclerosis and uh, you see something that doesn't look, look like a fibroma, it doesn't look like anything, think about fibroma-like cutaneous picoma. And a lot of genetic um, advancements have been done in picomas and we know now that half of them have TAC2 mutations. And that's very important because People, people can get targeted treatment. They can get mTOR inhibitors. Uh, patients with TC, TSC2 mutation will get mTOR inhibitors. So a picoma behaves aggressively, potentially have some possibility to work, where other, the other half, they have other mutational events like translocations, which uh, presumably is not going to work. And the differential is, the difference diagnosis is wide. You can have uh, from balloon cell nevus to melanoma to clear cell sarcoma, which uh, which can, which also stain for monocytic markers, but would also would stain for S100 SOC stain where picomas do not, or metastatic clear cell uh, carcinoma. So if you're going to do one panel, will be an S100 melan A H and B45 SMA Desmond. That's a good panel, initial panel to assess if you're dealing with a picoma and rule in or rule out other entities uh, within the uh, differential. Now the prognosis. People have done a lot of work in soft tissue and GYN picomas, which are more common. And we, we categorize picomas into benign, uncertain, or malignant. And we're looking about the size of the tumor is more or less than five centimeters, is it infiltrative or not, has a high nuclear grades, cellularity, mitotic activity, necrosis, vascular invasion, all that kind of stuff to put in categories. And uh, the picomas of uncertain malignant potential, they behave in an indolent fashion where the malignant Thomas, they behave aggressively. And uh, in terms of the skin, there are not that many uh, picomas. Um, very rare. All behave 
well, but I think the important thing is if you have a picoma in the skin that fulfills the criteria for malignancy, the first thing to do is to exclude a metastasis. That would be more common on the primary malignant picoma. And this was a fascinating case that actually was misdiagnosed. Um, it was a it was misdiagnosed the um, the picoma in the GYN in the uterus was misdiagnosed as a leiomyosarcoma because it was expressing smooth muscle markers. It metastasized to the skin, and because it was exp expressing um, melanocytic markers, it was misdiagnosed as melanoma, and then eventually went to the lung and then to the brain, and then they figured out that it was all a primary uterine malignant picoma that gave metastasis to the skin, to the brain, lung, et cetera. Fascinating case, extremely rare, but a scenario that you have uh, keep in mind. And a lot of other advances have been done in tumors with malocytic differentiation. Um, there's a new thing <clears throat> that resembles a picoma, but probably it's not. It has a recurrent actin MITF translocation and produces malocytic markers because the MITF is the master regulator of melanin synthesis. But it doesn't, although it looks kind of picoma, it's hugely positive for S100, and this is not expected in your typical picoma. So it may be a distinct entity, we'll see, uh, but it has recurrent translocation involving the MITF uh, gene. And uh, QSO sarcoma is another entity that I'm not going to talk about um, because I think you guys had enough, and I had enough.